In 1938, on the brink of World War II, Germany launched an expedition to Antarctica. They were losing the war and needed to act quickly. The plan was to develop a secret base on the surface of the continent. With Adolf Hitler on his last legs during the war, this secret base would be a safe haven for the Germans to recuperate and retaliate. But things didn't quite go as planned. Over several decades, quite a number of mysteries have been unexplored and unsolved on the continent of Antarctica. Some events have been scrapped from public records and hidden from public eyes. Well, not after this video. Let's investigate just what is being hidden on the surface of Antarctica. Back in the 1930s, Hitler strongly believed in a superior race and the idea of superior humans. And this is well known. What isn't well known is the extent to which Hitler and his Third Reich were willing to go to achieve this reality. You see, Hitler believed in hollow earth theory, and according to legends, such a place is inhabited by a human race far superior and much more powerful than regular humans. His plan was simple, gain their help and use their superior technology to achieve his dream. What was his dream, I hear you ask? A German empire lasting thousands of years. Hitler believed the opening to this hollow earth was located somewhere on the surface of Antarctica and decided to send expeditions to the South Pole. Combined with the fact that Antarctica happened to possess a rich supply of uranium, which he needed for fueling his super planes, he also wanted to establish a secret base of operations on the continent. His journey to Antarctica would be killing two birds with one stone. But here's where things get… interesting. Hitler's secret research institute, called the Annenerber, had intentions to explore the reality of religions and myths around the world. Now the idea was to combine ancient knowledge with scientific knowledge. This would make the Third Reich invincible. Even today, the secret services of world powers hunt for the secrets of Annenerber. Hitler's highest ranking officials also believed humans were not alone in the universe. They believed a higher knowledge was locked and hidden away in the form of ancient manuscripts, old carvings, and books. People who managed to lay their hands on these could be the new superpowers to rule the world. When the Americans defeated Germany in World War II, they were eager to learn every bit of knowledge the Germans had. But the Allies were shocked to discover that hundreds and thousands of qualified Third Reich specialists had suddenly vanished. Over 100 German submarines suddenly disappeared. Even more strangely, they weren't found dead on any of their records. The rumor at the time was that on the heels of the war, the Germans retreated to a secret base in Antarctica. Well, the Americans had to make sure. If the rumors were true, then the war wasn't over. So, the US military plans a secret expedition to Antarctica, codenamed Operation High Jump. Operation High Jump was supposed to last for six months, but something went very wrong with this mission. After just six weeks, the mission was aborted. At the beginning of 1947, the US Navy financed an expedition to the shores of Antarctica, led by none other than Admiral Richard Byrd. Under his command was quite the military squadron. He had an aircraft carrier, one submarine, 12 surface ships, 25 airplanes and helicopters, and more than 5,000 staff. Unlike his previous scientific expeditions, this was different. Well, for one, this was entirely financed by the Navy. And two, this was a very strong military squad for just research. Wouldn't you agree? Anyway, after a couple of weeks, full-scale reconnaissance began surveying the Antarctic region of Queen Maud Land. It was all going to plan. In the first week, the crew made significant discoveries and numerous photos were taken. But suddenly, the mission was called to an immediate halt. Something very strange was going on at the surface of Antarctica, and it had noticed the presence of the Americans. Many reports went out about the US retreat from Antarctica, but people weren't quite sure what was causing this. First, they lost a destroyer, dozens of sailors and officers, and even half of their carrier-based aircraft were destroyed. To warn Congress about what exactly was going on, Admiral Byrd said the following. In the event of another war, 
America can be attacked by an enemy that has the ability to fly from pole to pole with incredible speed. There was still one question hanging in the air. What made the Americans retreat? Let's rewind to 1945 to understand what was happening. Some 18 months before Admiral Byrd's expedition began, two German submarines were seen entering the Mar del Plata port in Argentina, surrendering to authorities. Now, these were no ordinary submarines. They were from the Führer Convoy, a top-secret fleet at the time. After several minutes of probing the submarine crew, the American authorities learned a few things. The commander of U-boat U-530 spoke of his involvement in an operation named Valkyrie 2. Here are the details. Two weeks before the end of the war, U-boat U-530 left the key with one destination in mind, the shores of Antarctica. On deck were passengers, riddled with injuries and covered in bandages. There were also Third Reich relics on board. Later, another U-boat was found heading to Antarctica. Several decades later, we would find out why. In 1820, Antarctica was discovered by two Russian explorers, Lazarev and Bellingshausen, respectively. And for almost a century, the continent remained unknown. But suddenly, the Germans had a strange interest in this icy landscape. Millions of dollars were being poured into the study of Antarctica. And finally, in the late 1930s, two research expeditions were launched. This expedition was right on the cusp of war. One morning in January 1939, two airplanes, the Passant and the Boreas, took off from the deck of the Schwabenland, a German cargo ship. These planes began patrolling Queen Maud land, and in the span of three weeks, managed to secure a large territory, the size of a country. This new territory was called New Swabia. Three months later, in April of the same year, Captain Alfred Richer wrote, I have completed the mission entrusted to me by Air Marshal Goring. For the first time, German aircraft flew over the Antarctic continent. Every 25 kilometers, we dropped pendants, covering an area of about 600,000 square kilometers. By all indications, the mission was a success. At the end of the world, a secret citadel had been made, and there have been recent theories and findings that back these claims. Huge underground lakes were found kilometers deep under the ice, and located above the water's surface are dome-like vaults filled with warm air. Some theories believe that it is possible that from these heated lakes, a constant river of warm water flows into the ocean. Well, these warm rivers may have formed large underground ice tunnels perfect for the construction of secret bases. This would allow any submarine to easily pass under the coastal ice into the tunnels, immune from storms, polar cold, and out of enemy reach. If there was such a location, this would be it. According to eyewitness testimony and many documents, the Nazis had managed to create this top secret base. They called it Base 211. You see, at the start of 1939, regular trips were made between Antarctica and Germany in a specially equipped and modified research vessel called the Swabia. Mine constructing equipment, railroad machinery, trucks, and giant tunnel building mills were being transported to Queen Maud land. As these trips were going on, skilled workers, engineers, and scientists also arrived. Why was Germany in need of such a remote base? Well, there are various assumptions. Some believed that Germany wanted control of the southern seas, while others thought that the Germans were just attracted to the natural resources on the continent. But many believed that in case the Germans lost the war, Antarctica would be a secret hiding spot for the elite of the Third Reich. By the end of 1946, Admiral Richard Byrd received the order to destroy the Nazi base in Antarctica. But here's where things take a left turn. The American squadron reported being met with heavy resistance, including fighter jets and strange aircraft they described as flying saucers. According to Admiral Byrd, they emerged from the water at high speeds, causing heavy damage to the expedition. This was one of such encounters by an experienced pilot named John Syerson. I witnessed a terrifying incident while on the deck of Casablanca. Two flying saucers emerged from the water with incredible speed, dodging between the ship masts and disrupting the radio antenna. Before I could even blink, 
The saucers then dove into the ray that destroyed two Corsair planes. I watched in horror as our destroyer ship, the Murdoch, burst into flames and began to sink just 120 feet away. Despite the danger, rescue teams and lifeboats rushed to the scene, and the chaos lasted for about 20 minutes. When the saucers finally submerged, we assessed the damage and it was devastating. After the pilot's testimony, one question comes to mind. Who did the flying saucers belong to? Nazi Germany or unknown forces? After World War II, in Nazi secret archives, these drawings proved that German scientists were actually engaged in the development of disc-shaped aircraft. Now, at the time, nothing like these aircrafts existed. So how exactly did the Germans pull this off? In 1935, the secret society known as the Annenerber was founded. The society consisted of high-ranking Nazi officials and Third Reich leaders. These leaders knew that the war was coming and that an army's size wasn't necessary to win future wars. So they adopted qualitative superiority. Basically, you could win a war with limited numerical strength and higher strategic planning. The Annenerber brought in specialists in paranormal knowledge in order to achieve breakthroughs where their opponents would not be competent. Their search began just before World War II with the aid of a map discovered by historians in 1929. This was the famous Pierre Ries map. In the early 16th century, Turkish Admiral Pierre Ries created a map that mirrors the real Antarctic coast. This was 300 years before the official discovery of the continent. In his map notes, he described how he drew the map from numerous sources some sources even older than 3,000 years. For many years, international experts and cartographers have been left stumped as to how the Pierre Ries map could have made such detail in those times. Suffice it to say that this aided the Anierber in their search of hidden knowledge. Flashbackward a century, and the map shows the possibility of finding the Aryan race. It brought hope to the search for ancient technology from Atlantis. According to some theories, they believe that Antarctica is the former Atlantis buried under layers of ice from pole displacement. After taking what they wanted, they began searching for ancient relics and manuscripts around the world, from Tibet to South America. Notably, they searched the Knights Templar archives, which were similar manuscripts to the Pierre Ries map. It suggested that they knew something important about Antarctica they confiscated libraries of several faculties and secret societies. In March of 1945, one librarian said he witnessed the group evacuating a library with several thousands of volumes. According to popular belief, it's very likely that the Anierber learned something incredible about Antarctica. Unfortunately, records about their achievements have been scrapped from existence. But many have speculated that the Anierber had discovered something far advanced from their current technology. From their long list of findings, the Anierber had discovered flying saucers. In 1942, sightings of flying saucers were more rampant than ever. According to numerous descriptions, these aircraft used a different source of energy called the converter of Hans Kohler which required no fossil fuel. In the seized archives recovered after the war, another mysterious document was discovered. It was a blueprint for a huge 139 meter long disc-shaped ship called the Andromeda. Some believed the purpose of this aircraft was for long-term spaceflight, and some believe their purpose to be much simpler, transportation of goods, equipment, and technology for the secret bases of the Third Reich including Antarctica. According to American intelligence, by the end of the war, the Germans had nine research enterprises developing and testing flying disks. Further investigations also revealed that eight of these factories, along with scientists and key figures, were successfully evacuated from Germany into unknown underground facilities. Many rumors are still associated with the disks of the Third Reich. There are also many stories about German disks flying out of Antarctic waters in 1947. 
However, more recently, the number of sightings of unidentified flying objects emerging from seas, oceans, and lakes has rocketed. The same high-speed disks, shining saucers, and dome-like aircraft were also seen in northern countries, South America, Australia, and South Africa. They were everywhere. At the same time, UFOs were also being reported to the USSR Navy intelligence. But wait, if the Germans didn't attack the American expedition in 1947, who did? First rank Captain Viktor Brezhnev of the Soviet Navy Intelligence said they regularly received reports on strange objects detected by eyewitnesses. Unknown flying objects were also being discovered around the world, even in the Atlantic, South Atlantic, and Antarctica. One peculiar case was where these strange objects were observed in the islands of South Georgia. The fishermen in the area claimed they saw an object fly out from the water and managed to take a photograph. Despite the strong wind in the area, the object was seen to remain static for a long time. Now, clearly this wasn't a cloud, it was something else. In another case, in 1979, the disc hung over the sky and was visible for a while during daylight, just before sunset, and after sunset before zooming off into the distance. The reports were that this object, whatever it was, had a symmetrical circular shape and could travel at ridiculous speeds. Three years before this sighting, Japanese researchers using the latest equipment detected 20 round aircraft that entered Antarctica and disappeared from all screens and radars. They just seemed to vanish into thin air. Who were they and where did they go? Well, today, we have the answers. In the late 1980s, astrophysicist Kip Thorne proposed the concept of nearly instantaneous movement in space and time travel. Together with his colleagues, they put forward the idea of wormholes and black holes. According to these physicists, black holes are located at close distances to our planet and also take the form of wormholes. Now, these wormholes can be used for intergalactic and interstellar travel. At least, that would be the goal. Kip Thorne's running theory was that close to Earth, there was an entrance into a wormhole leading to the star Vega. He assumed that with the amount of UFO sightings all over the country, the speedy aircraft had a way to instantly move across space-time and seemingly vanish out of our planet, undetected and untraceable. In 1992, the construction of a powerful radio-electronic complex called HAARP began. To the public, this organization was to study the ionosphere and the development of middle defense systems. But to a select few, it was to develop new weapons, weather weapons, geophysical weapons, and even psychological warfare devices. But several decades later, it is assumed that the creation of the complex was to search for entrances and exits of the wormhole several years prior. Six years later, in 1998, some physicists theorized the idea of tunnel effects. Generally, the average UFO would emerge through the atmosphere in Antarctica and leave through the atmosphere of Alaska. Another popular theory is that the North Pole of the Earth is an entrance and that the South Pole of the Earth is an outlet that links our planets and stars on a certain energy level. Despite all the theories supporting this grand mystery, the more we scrutinize certain parts of the story, the more we realize that a lot of it was all made up. One of the major problems with the secret Nazi base belief is that there seem to be various accounts of what really happened on the surface of Antarctica. Different authors have different perspectives, but all of them share one thing in common, a lack of hard evidence. Authors like Sazibo Ladislas, Matern and Frederick, and Robert all construct different accounts of what happened on the Antarctica expeditions, and without evidence, these would be chucked up as speculation. From the German archives retrieved by the United States, there was no mention of any intention to establish a base during the expedition of 1938. One of the major sources of speculation were claims appealing to a statement Admiral Karl Donitz first mentioned. The German submarine fleet is proud of having built for the Führer in another part of the world. 
Another excerpt of the same quote was also mentioned by authors in which Carl Donzit boasts an invulnerable fortress and a quote, paradise-like oasis in the middle of the ocean. But let's take a deeper look at the course of events. Is it even feasible that the Schwabenland and its crew had time to build a base at the coastlines or anywhere near the shores of Antarctica? Here's a little stat sheet. It took the NBSA, the Norwegian Swedish British Antarctic Expedition, 18 days to build their first hut at the Modheim base in February of 1950, and they used caterpillars and heavy duty equipment. It took Amundsen's South Polar Party 14 days to build their hut at their base in 1911, and they had many sledges and 80 dogs. However, the Schwabenland was reportedly off the coast for a month, and the ship logs prove without doubt that most of the time all they did was steam to and fro along the coast, taking marine samples. There would have been very little time for it to offload the amount of equipment needed to build a base, either at the coast or inland. Yes, the Germans did visit Antarctica, but for reconnaissance purposes only. The U-boats, did U-530 and U-977 visit Antarctica? Well, short answer, it was Ladislaus Szabo who invented the story that two submarines had transported Hitler to Antarctica. Every other variation you find on the internet was just a spin-off of the original. According to interrogation reports and observations, the U-530 and U-997 weren't how the authors had described them. The real U-boats were much larger and not as fast. From public records, both boats didn't leave the dock on the same day, but on different occasions. The authors thought it a good idea to have them depart on the same day to make the secret submarine convoy theory believable. Let's forget for one second about the public records and look at the science. Could the boats even make such a journey? The first obstacle would be the Southern Ocean itself, and if that wasn't enough, you'd have to overcome the packs of ice that surround Antarctica during winter. Satellite data revealed by NASA shows that the ice pack extends around 500 kilometers outward from the coast. So, to reach the coast, the U-boats would have had to travel some 1,000 kilometers under ice. And here's the thing, diesel submarines are not made for under ice operations. Then we get to Operation High Jump. Many theories claimed that the US sent a squadron to Antarctica in 1946 to destroy the secret Nazi base. One example would be the interrogation of U-boat crews in 1945, but there was no evidence to back this up. There were also several claims that Admiral Byrd claimed that the High Jump's objective was to quote, break the last desperate resistance of Adolf Hitler. Yet again, no source was given for this quote. Operation High Jump indeed was the largest ever expedition to Antarctica, with over 4,700 men. But the main reason for the expedition was to train the US Navy in polar operations. It was a military operation. At the time, the US Navy saw the Soviets as a threat and believed there was going to be an Arctic war. Nonetheless, Operation High Jump was an early exercise of the coming Cold War, designed to increase the US Navy's fighting prowess. As early as the 1950s, rumors also began to spread about flying saucers encountered in some German circles, and that these were the new weapons of the Third Reich. But these claims were all false. Talks about Admiral Byrd seeing UFOs and flying saucers were just bad translations or deliberate mistranslations of the original Spanish recording from Admiral Byrd. Equally, the Onanerber was a secret cult that operated during World War II. They focused on various pseudoscientific and occult research, but there's no credible evidence linking their activities directly to the Piri Reis map. Now, all these are what the critics are saying, and in a way they are correct, but here's where their allegations start to shake. Hitler wouldn't invest so much resources into the unknown if it was proven at one time to be true. Do you know how much he invested in the occult? A lot. And this was during the war. I don't think he would do that if he wasn't certain of some things. Sure, some pictures of UFOs could be hoaxes, but certainly not all. 1945 really felt like the world was ending. There was the Second World War, then the Hiroshima bombing. I don't know about you, but if my existence was threatened, I wouldn't risk exposure to save myself and my race. And it felt like that was what our neighbors, aka the aliens, were doing. Also, Admiral Byrd himself said he saw and witnessed something he couldn't just explain. 
According to him, another world was entirely hidden in Antarctica. The crazy thing is, after his debriefing with the United States government, he was ordered to never speak of his encounter again. And to top it off, his very son committed quote-unquote suicide at a dirty, poor, rundown alley. Let me explain what I mean. Bird wrote a diary just before he died, detailing his encounter with the strange world he saw. Of course, he was about to die, so the order given to him 50 years ago didn't matter anymore. Now, his son found the diary and released it and was going to show more proof of his father's encounter, but the morning he was supposed to unveil this proof, his body was found in an alley and the cause of death, according to the police, was dehydration and malnourishment. Which of course is a blatant lie, because Bird's son is from a rich family. Bird himself was very wealthy and well known, so how could someone who could afford five square meals be malnourished and dehydrated? And lastly, isn't it just weird that the whole world, despite their differences in policies, all came together to say, no, you can't come to Antarctica? I'm serious. Try booking a flight to Antarctica and see how far you can go. This is known as the Antarctica Treaty. When you add all these up, it starts to look very much like there was something Hitler found that the Allies found when they took over and definitely the world leaders found that they would do anything to keep secret. Once again, Bird gave a chilling detailed encounter of what he saw. Luckily, we have a video on it, and you can check it out here. After you watch it, you will start to see that you are not crazy.